we did a series of them at the 25th anniversary. Dr. Churn spoke at that one. And, uh, when it was held at the library? Yeah. Down in Orange County? No, it was um, around the LAX area. Well, this is the Apollo 13 25th anniversary uh, that uh, was mainly um, uh, so Tom, uh, Tom Hanks was supposed to be there, but uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Doogie Howser <laughs> uh, hosted it, and Gene Kranz was the co host. And that's why, after 25 years, ran into all my technicians and everybody. It was a lot of fun. And uh, it was just be before the Apollo 13 uh, movie. Is that, is that the, um, the poster or the? It, yeah. It's the. Uh, for the program, the, the program. program for the for the anniversary. Yeah, there's all the you know pictures and stuff like that in it. A lot of good pictures. I should have sent this to you. Oh, I'd love to see it. Yeah, yeah. maybe you can photo it, and uh, we can see the the whole thing. Uh, Ken, let me know when uh, basically everybody in the waiting room has been admitted. Yeah, I think right now everybody's uh, in. Oh, one more, okay. three more. One second. Okay. I suppose we should be courteous and wait a minute or so to. Uh, yeah, I think we'll, for a minute it will be good. Yeah. The people keep coming in right now. I can't tell you how many people actually ended up uh, signing up. I, I yeah, wouldn't. it's good. <laughs> I kept moving the, uh, the the acknowledgments into the into a single folder. And then I didn't have a chance to go back and read all the names and stuff. So yeah, it's exciting, very interesting topic. Yeah, indeed, it was you know the the, the uh, successful failure of the era. It's a it's success, big success. Do I have to put this in three times? Who's that? Oh, you know what? I didn't put the rest of it. It's a you know, it's not a bad time to unmute Jerry, actually. Uh, Jerry Lockenauer? Uh No, Jerry Jerry Olbram. Oh, he's he's uh, hey, he Is was on. Um, yeah, he's online, but he's uh, he's muted according to the to this display I have. Okay. But anyway, uh, I didn't mute him. I think he's actually. Okay. Oh, he actually okay. offline. Oh, he went offline. Could you ask him to call again? Uh, um, oh, okay. No, okay. I see, I see him. He's okay. Okay. I think he muted himself. I didn't mute him. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Jerry. Are you there? Yeah. Okay, well, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Let's go ahead and go to the next screen. Okay, well, um, uh, I didn't uh, mute anything. Uh, am I online with you uh, where you can hear me? Yeah, we can all hear you. Uh, let me give you a quick introduction and, and then we'll let you go ahead and actually open the program. Uh, yeah, because um, what I'm going to plan to say is how did it happen that the LMD was made by STLTRW mm -hmm. and uh, how uh, an overview of of what it uh, what made it unique and then relate to uh, the fact that uh, we used it on uh, Apollo. Uh, 13 uh and that uh, thanks to all of that success was the people that made the engine perfectly and uh, that it had no failures and no flaws and and they're the people that that we have to thank for the return of apollo 13. so that's a very good brief summary of 
what okay. I'd like to say. Okay, Jerry. Uh, so for your information right now, since you're on phone rather than on a, on a video feed, uh, the, uh, uh, the, what's what's displaying on the screen right now for everybody that's on video is the Apollo mission summary and it opens up with the payload being Odyssey and Aquarius, the command module and lunar module respectively. But the launch was on April 11th, 1970 at 13.13 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time uh, from launch pad 39A on the booster Saturn V AS-508 that the spacecraft did at one and a half orbits at an altitude of about 119 miles and uh, that the total flight duration was five days instead of the intended 10 and that the distance traveled was 62,000 miles, uh, 620,000 miles, I'm sorry, just barely more than enough to go to and from the, the moon. And um, that the destination had been from Muro, but that site was reassigned to Apollo 14, which was a very successful flight. Uh, that there was a launch anomaly on the S2 stage that shut down two minutes early during the, uh, the, the uh, transition during the entry to the lunar, uh, to the lunar orbit, to the, <laughs> anyway, um, and that the uh, lunar module burns, lunar module descent engine burns were like 35 seconds at five hours after the explosion. And uh, to, to go from the uh, initial uh, orbital, insertion uh, or path flight trajectory to a free return trajectory and then five minutes to after rounding the moon to speed up the return and that there were critical shortages in carbon dioxide scrubbers power heat and potable water and that everybody that was involved in it was extremely busy for four days doing the orbital and operational State planning to get a successful flashdown on April 17th in the Pacific Ocean. So, okay, so with that, uh, let's leave that one up and let Jerry do his introduction. Okay. Well, and let me, let me say, uh, this is Jerry Elvrum. Uh, Jerry was the uh, uh, VP in, in the Applied Technology Division when I worked at TRW. And he was uh, the developer of the concept of the, uh, of the Pintle thr variable thrust engine that was the core of the lunar module descent engine. Uh, that engine, of course, was the, the, the power that enabled them to uh, alter their orbit, uh, alter their uh, path or trajectory to the moon to return and come back quicker. And uh, it's also used in the uh, in the SpaceX for engines, which is what enables them to do a deep throttling. It it can throttle the engine, the thrust, from about a thousand pounds. To almost uh, no, it's from yeah, from about a thousand pounds to about ten thousand pounds of thrust, which is one of the deepest throttling engines ever developed, and uh, that's what enabled the landing on the moon. And so, um, Jerry retired some years ago, and he's uh, currently re uh, he's been very active in, in several events over the course of the years, including an excellent presentation last year at the Retirement Association, which I understand was subsequently recorded for NASA. So, Jerry? All right. <clears throat> uh, what I'd like to do is to 
talk about how it happened that the that the Lem engine was made by STL TRW instead of one of the giants in the propulsion field back in those days. Uh, uh, in June 1961, when, when an astonished Congress finally agreed to fund the Apollo program, there really were only eight and a half years remaining in before this decade is out. A year later, NASA finally chose Lunar Orbit Rendezvous as the vehicle system configuration and the float profile with the highest probability of meeting that challenge. By that time, there was only seven and a half years left of the decade to perform that impossible dream. At the time of that commitment to the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, there was one really explicitly defined major show-shopping technological challenge, uh, deorbiting and landing the 40,000-pound lunar module required a large rocket engine having on-demand variable thrust over a 10 to 1 range, and it had to be restartable many times in space. No such large rocket engine had ever been designed, let, let alone demonstrated. Grumman, who had been selected as the Lunar Excursion Module Prime Contractor, therefore chose Rocketdyne, who was the top rocket engine company of that era, to develop a lunar module excursion mo uh, module uh, engine. So how did it happen that on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were standing in the Lunar Module Eagle on top of a deep throttling rocket engine developed by a few young engineers at a new company called Space Technology Laboratories. In retrospect, over the last 50 years, one answer to that question keeps intruding into my mind, and that is that I was propelled along an education and career path that led inevitably to that highly improbable event. Following discharge from the Army Air Corps in 1946, I received a Bachelor of Physics degree from the University of Minnesota in August 1949. After searching in vain for three weeks for a company in Minneapolis that wanted a physicist, I saw a tiny ad in the newspaper to, to ride to California for 25 bucks, so I went. After a couple weeks in California, I again saw a small ad uh, in uh, asking for uh, chemist uh, assistant up at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And in a career destiny type of event, I talked my way into that chemist job, even though I was uh, degreed as a physicist. Amazingly, many of the pioneering rocket propellant and combustion technologies that I researched during the next 10 years at JPL turned out to be exactly those things that permitted me to design a throttleable rocket engine just when it was needed to accomplish the Apollo moon mission. In the fall of 1958, director of JPL left to become president of the new company called Space Technology Laboratory. And I was motivated to join STL in January 1959 as head of their advanced propulsion section. By June 1960, I had invented a totally unique design concept for a rocket engine that could be throttled over a wide range of thrust for, and, and the purpose was to maneuver spacecraft around in orbit. The little engine had 500 pounds thrust and could be throttled down to as low as 20 pounds. In 1960, I was demonstrating that engine at a small STL rocket test facility in Englewood, California. The unique design elements of that engine were a pair of variable throat area cavitating Venturi flow control valves 
which provided independent absolute flow and mixture ratio control over the entire throttling portion of the LIMD duty cycle. The control pintles of those valves were coupled directly to a single moving sleeve on a centrally located pintle injector. That sleeve controlled the injection velocities of both the oxidizer and fuel at their optimum values for performance over the entire throttling range without affecting the controlled flow rates. Just a year later, in June 1961, the Apollo program was born. By late 1962, the Rocketdyne engine having been selected by Grumman, was having various problems and NASA was getting very nervous and decided they needed to get a backup engine under development. NASA and Grumman both laughed when I asked to, uh, to bid for the backup, but when they really understood how that design could solve most of the operating and stability problems that had drove them to want a backup program, they agreed to allow us to bid. But they said that the top STL management had to agree that we would build a complete new rocket test facility that could test that engine at 41 to 8 columbium nozzle extension through a full duty cycle at vacuum. And uh, my boss, Art Grant, at that time went to the top STL managers and convince them that if we could win the backup, our design would win the actual flight engine. The STL managers, uh, headed by Cy Ramo and Louis Dunn and Ruth Mettler and so forth, agreed. So we scaled up the 500 pound thrust engine to 5,000 pounds, which was the maximum we could run at the Little Inglewood test facility. That 5,000 pound engine worked perfectly. However, NASA and Grumman were not convinced that the engine would not go unstable. If they wanted to see a series of bomb tests at the full diameter of the uh, actual lunar module engine uh, flight design. So we built a mild steel 17 inch diameter chair chamber to carry out those tests with the 5,000 pound injector head end. Uh, it, that engine got called the Iron Pig and we scheduled the test for a Saturday, but by the time we got the engine and bombs set up, uh, both NASA and Grumman key managers were there at our test site before we could even fire a checkout test. Of course, my management was not too happy about that, but it was either don't fire and lose, or fire and go unstable and lose, or fire and demonstrate the inherent stability of our unique engine central pintle design. We fired bombs in multiple locations at multiple times and at various thrust levels during that one day, and that test Series 1 STL, the backup program, in July 1963. From that point on, events continued to the improbable, but in retrospect, seemingly to me now, inevitable final selection in January 1965 of the STL lunar module descent engine for the actual Apollo flight program. By that time, there were only five years remaining in the decade to meet the Apollo mission goal. But for TRW's engine, we had to complete development, qualification, and deliver eight flight engines to Grumman by May 1967. That was only 30 months away, and that was a real challenge. The NASA decision to go with TRW, however, was proven to be a good one during the very difficult but success successful first lunar landing of Apollo 11 in 1969, and during all of the subsequent five successful moon landings. 
Then 10 months after Apollo 11 came, the the oxygen-triggered explosion in the service module of Apollo 13. The service module engine had already uh, had a lunar orbit burn, which took the combined spacecraft out of a free return trajectory around the moon. Because NASA did not know the extent of damage in the service module or what effect it had on the service module propulsion system, they were afraid to try to fire the service module engine to establish a new return to Earth trajectory. The most viable option was to use the LIM-D to perform the trajectory maneuvers to return the spacecraft to Earth. Because the damage required conserving command module resources for re-entry and maintaining three astronauts for days in the limited resources of the lunar module, the LEM would have to turn burn again a after it came out on the other side of the moon to put them on the fastest trajectory home, which was still consistent with the required Earth entry trajectory and times in order to do the final uh, Earth landing. The LEM was perfectly suited to perform such firings. We had proved its ability to restart in space many times with proper time sequencing. And during Apollo 9, it had actually pushed the combined spacecraft system test around in space. So the real heroes of the LEM-D part of the safe return of Apollo 13 were the dedicated personnel at TRW and all of the subcontractors and vendors who produced that hardware with flawless perfection. They were responsible for me being able to talk to you today. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, give you a few words on this anniversary of Apollo 13. Wow. Every time you tell a story like that, I get um, impressed and inspired all over again. It's a, a, well, it's an unusual story, I'll have to say that. Yes, and, uh, and there, there's a story you tell about, uh, um, I'm going to have to call this guy back. Um, is the story you tell about the landing on the moon where uh, the, the other unique feature about this engine was demonstrated or was, had an opportunity to be de demonstrated, namely that the, uh, uh, the nozzle of the engine reached down very close to the ground uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a normal landing and that uh, we didn't know what size rocks there might be on the moon, where they might be. And you really can't see them at the end of the, of the flight for the pilot. So as, uh, as they were descending, I think you had a story, you had a story about that. And so well, why don't you go ahead and do that. Yeah. We, we had a requirement to, that, that our nozzle extension, the Columbium nozzle extension, could crush uh, up to 28 inches. So if in, in, in effect, uh, we were looking like a 28-inch NASA specification rock. And in order to save money when we got that requirement from, from Grumman, we actually set up a system at uh, TRW Space Park in which we were going to demonstrate crushing capabilities and uh, rig that system up. We bought a bunch of, of uh, aluminum garbage cans from Sears Roebuck, and that was what we used to calibrate the uh, crushing uh, system that we put together at, at Space Park. Uh, I know that... Uh, some of the people at NASA got got a kick out of the fact that we were 
spending up to $4.95 every time we tested one of those garbage cans. Hello? Gary, your mic's turned off. Uh, did I get offline somehow? No, you're online, but I think Gary... There Mike, we go. Mike is, okay, he's back. Uh, I thought that Ken had, re, uh, had unmuted me again, but uh, interrupted by a necessary phone call from another person who wants to join. Anyway, um, hey, Ken, if uh, Frank Sterling is in the waiting room, why go ahead and let him in. Okay. Okay, so now, um, yeah, so the, one of the guys who was involved in two aspects of the, uh, of the LMD engine uh, is also online here, and that's John Stamreich. And I'm going to just go ahead and let him introduce himself and carry on with the presentation. So um, why don't you go ahead, uh, John, uh, John, just ask for any, any uh, of the uh, charts that you want to see. And uh, we can okay. we'll try to do that. Ken will try to do that. Thank you. Well, let's see. So I graduated uh, in, in June of 1966 uh, from uh, engineering school. And 30 days later, I was on the floor of, of Grumman looking at LEM1 and LEM2 being constructed. <laughs> uh, I was hired by, um, uh, by Grumman as a uh, propulsion engineer. Um, and uh, it was at a time when um, the design th the design was theoretically frozen, and all the uh, test engines, all the test products were arriving. And as you might imagine, many of them were flunking their uh, development testing. And so it was it was a it was a a, a great time for a young engineer to 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 join. I was assigned to the descent engine um, group of the. There was three of us. And they had just chosen TRW. And my boss, Hank the Gammon, he gave me um, six inches of paper, which was the, the TRW proposal, and six inches was the rocket time proposal. And he said, OK, uh, we've chosen TRW. Uh, NASA wants you to take uh, these two stacks and convert them into a two inch stack for NASA. <laughs> so I had to read both proposals which as a young engineer made me very dangerous for TRW because <laughs> I had their proposal. I knew everything they promised. Um, one of my jobs was to uh, receive the, uh, uh, the engine when it came to, uh, to Grumman. And, the, and, the, and the, there were very few engines. There was just one engine that had been fired. Uh, and uh, I had to do a fit check with it. I had to uh, do a, 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 a test set. The test set had never been used. It, uh, it, uh, when I plugged the engine in, I blew out all the fuses on it. <laughs> so I, I got to know all of the uh, TRW people very, very quickly. So for a year and a half, um, um, the, um, I, I had the opportunity to be involved in the lunar module uh, in many different ways. One of the, uh, I used to have to stand up every, um, every morning between 5.30 and, uh, and 7.30 and uh, go to the LEM1 vehicle managers meeting, to LEM2, LEM3, and tell them why TRW wasn't delivering their engines and uh, when, when they could, uh, when they could uh, 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 you know, get them, which <laughs> taught me uh, a lot about uh, how to handle very aggressive vehicle managers. But one of the things that, uh, that stands out, uh, we uh, Grumman was testing the first delivered engine down at White Sands. And, uh, and one of the things they found out that was a, one of the tests was done with the landing radar attached to the underside of the, of the test vehicle. And they discovered that the landing radar, when you fired the engine, would think it was a big rock and shut the engine down. And uh, they, uh, 
they, they tried everything and they couldn't fix it. So I got a call from the, as a young engineer, I got a call from every, every morning I had to do a, a, a phone call down the White Sands and get the, the test results and put it on um, the chief engineer's desk. And um, I get, so I got to know him. So he called, my boss called me in and sat down with the chief engineer and said, we've had it with all this electronics. It's, it's never going to be ready on time. So he says, good chance for you to learn how to do, um, how to get through um, um, and um, learn how to work in a, in a big company. So I had the job, uh, oh, I had the job of uh, going in and adding a, uh, um, a 28 okay. volt switch okay. to the panel in the, uh, in, the, in the lunar module and sneak it, sneak yeah. the wires down first into the battery and then down to Downst uh, through the guillotine. Um, Ken Saunders. And between I, don't and see, and I don't see them though. And, and to... I don't see, did you see, I don't, did you see them on the, I don't see them there. Can you hear me? Harry? Yeah, they then call them, yeah, okay. Okay, anyway, bottom line to it, it's called a descent engine override right. switch. And, um, and uh, so I had to go uh, learn how to get all the drawings changed. All the drawings were frozen for the whole vehicle. I had to go argue with all these gray haired guys about why this wasn't going to screw everything up. And um, so uh, many years later, when um, the first one, Apollo, Apollo um, 11 was landing, you, you, and you hear uh, Neil Armstrong going through the call out of what he's doing. He gets about uh, approximately a thousand feet off the uh, lunar surface and he gets the command to um, uh, decent override switch on. And what that did is it put 28 volts on the uh, shutoff valve engine, which means that no, no matter what computer did what to, to basically uh, interfere, the astronaut was flying manually. And uh, many years later, when I was uh, given Neil Armstrong an award for, um, uh, for at the, the Jonathan Club, you know, he introduced me as the switch guy. I mean, he says every, and at the 25th anniversary, uh, Gene Kranz told me that every pilot astronaut knew that dirty little secret was that they were landing manually. He said all, all the computer people felt that their computers were doing it but it was going manually. But so anyway, after about a year and a half um, of, um, of drinking from a fire hose at, uh, at Grumman, uh, one of my jobs uh, was to, uh, everything was by, uh, by telegram, by Twix back and forth. And I was not married uh, at, early on. Um, and I, um, the company uh, shut down at 4.30 and that's, uh, you know, that's um, uh, 8.30, uh, uh, no, it's, uh, I'm sorry, 7.30, West Coast time. So I would take all the telegrams and uh, and feed them into the machine so that they would all arrive at TRW um, um, uh, at 7.30 in the morning. Arnie Hoffman was the program manager. So I, I got it. I was the uh, conduit. I knew everything that was going on you know, <laughs> at 22 or 23 at that point. So anyway, um, I got to be well known uh, at TRW, and I was um, I was on the design. I, I was the I represented uh, Grumman on the throttle actuator uh, design review board at the Bendix with uh, uh, with Ron Gilgey, um, and so I so anyway so Harvey Wright, uh, who was the man who designed all the main valves and was uh, TRW's uh, main valve guy for everything. Um, said he was tired of working on the engine and he asked Don Harvey if they could hire me. So I ended up, I came to California and, and ended up as the uh, shutoff valve responsible engineer. Um, and can, can you put up that chart uh, with the uh, uh, engineering and management chart? Okay, uh, one second. Sure. Well, while he's doing that, so. Um, the interesting thing about the engines, uh, like uh, the um, the decent engine, um, um, the head end of the engine, which had the injector and all the valves and every, all the valves on it and everything, was sent down to the, the vertical engine test stand in Capistrano, and they 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 
put uh, they put uh, water through it to basically adjust the um, the mixing of the fuel and oxidizer and uh, and uh, and basically get all the settings right, and then they they uh, uh, they blew it out with GN2, and then they sent it back to Space Park where they added the uh, the the um, the chamber to it. Unfortunately, uh, well, that's not but, the test meeting. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. No, Never, did you see it? Did you see the the? Uh, yes, I see it. Okay. Let me know when you want to change it. Okay. So. Um, um, so what, what they what would happen is um, the shutoff valve had to have uh, uh, a maximum leakage rate of, of, of 10, 10, 10 SECs an hour, and that's that's pretty tight. And so they put they put nitrogen pressure pressure on the engine, and um, and then downstream they would run a little um, flex line into a into a. Um, uh, to um, uh, a vial of alcohol, and they would measure what the leak, leak rate was. Make a long story short of the eight uh, ball valves, uh, every, on every engine after that vertical, and they just said one of them would leak. So I, I had two tech, techs that basically had to go tear into the, uh, the shutoff valve, fix it, then they would uh, test it, and we would, um, uh, Sent it back out after it had the chamber on it, and they would they fire they turned on a capistrano, they fire it again, uh, this time with propellants, and would come back to Space Park, and it would leak. <laughs> so, over a four-year period, uh, I think I we had to change uh, several. I I lost count, probably fifty best seals. Um, but one little story little when story I was when I was when I was giving. I was um, uh, um, the uh, Howard Hughes Award when I was on, on, running the, uh, the Aero Club, um, the um, uh, anyway, I got a chance to uh, give one of the seals that came out of Apollo 13 um, to uh, uh, the astronauts. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Doing that, but anyway, so the, the chart you're looking at is um, the contract uh, was running out between between uh, between uh, TRW and uh, um, and um, um, Grumman first. That's why I'm hesitating. Uh, and so uh, the engines were supposed to be all delivered by that time, and they and they and they were by by 1969. So there was a proposal put together uh, to, to say uh, these are the these are the people who were working who who were build, working on the engine, and uh, for a couple of million dollars we'll we'll, we'll keep hiring them. Uh, so, um, so next chart. So you'll no keep well, going. One second. Okay. What you're going to, what you're going to see is uh, the uh, eight engineers that basically were responsible for all the development of the uh, of the engines uh, uh, from uh, 1967 through uh, 1970, actually. And you can see uh, some of these names people will recognize. Bill King, uh, of course, was re responsible for the, the uh, overall mechanical design and his team. Ron Gilgey was responsible for the throttle actuator and all the electronics. Gordon Sign was responsible for the uh, throttling Venturi uh, uh, and the injector uh, uh, design. Um, Jack Masiri was responsible for designing the chambers. The, the chambers, uh, the, the, they were uh, ablatively cooled. They were not... Uh, uh, cooled with uh, running the propellant through the ch through the chamber walls. What they were were they were a mixture of glass that when you fired the engine they would gradually melt. And uh, the limitation was like all rockets, the performance of a rocket is is very dependent on the ratio between the chamber and the and the throat. And as the and as the throat 
starts to wear, the performance drops. So it's very important that uh, that the uh, um, that uh, the cooling uh, is, is maintained. But at the same time, when when uh, when, you, when you cycle it, the glass when it, when it came down to room temperature would crack. So a lot a lot of the um, chat the challenge was how many times can you fire the engine before you launch it uh, to prove that it's good without putting cracks into the glass um, uh, um, chambers uh, that, and so um, so that's what that's what Jack did and uh, and you'll see a 24 year old guy there uh, responsible for all the main valves <laughs> um, and then there's um, uh, Tom Fitzgerald who was the guy who ran around and made sure all the hardware it was in the right spot at the right time and uh, Jack Sears and Bob Baker and those folks and, Ar and Arnie Parnell were the guys who basically kept, uh, uh, they were the ones who had the computer models and would tell, um, would tell Gordon Sign and the, and the people that were firing the engines to, whether, that, whether the engine needed more fuel, more rocks, whatever it did to maintain the, the ratios. So, um, so let's see. So, um, I, I got married early on in the middle of all this, and um, uh, my wife's got tremendous patience. Uh, did, well, while technicians were being paid at, on and off on 12-hour shifts, um, we <laughs> we were working 24 hours if it need be, and that was it. <laughs> it was kind of like there were no no backups. Um, the uh, the picture next to it was kind of a um, uh, interesting tongue in cheek. When I was a when I was a, uh, a, a uh, engineer at Grumman, uh, and I mentioned that uh, when the first engine arrived uh, to test out the test set, um, first thing that happened is the test set blew out the uh, the fuses in the they call them shunts <laughs> in the throttle actuator, and that turned out to be a problem because I got on the side. Uh, what I found out uh, uh, what happened was. Uh, plant five, the big hangar where there were uh, there were uh, four ascent stages and and three descent stages, all being built at the same time, um, was a was a big metal building. It was a big clean giant clean room, and outside uh, they were adding a uh, an, an annex to it. And they, uh, I was uh, walking between buildings, and, and we were trying to figure out why the test set was was making the throttle actuator. Um, cycle, uh, even though it wasn't turned on, and and I walk as I walking by, I realized that they they had grounded the arc welder for the steel structure, you know, to to uh, to the steel structure, and and on the inside, our test set was grounded to the same steel structure, and so I got a couple of walkie talkies that had my text uh, tell me every time they struck an arc was the or was it was the engine uh, cycling and sure enough that's what it was but uh, so a uh, little side story anyway the tongue-in-cheek here was TRW was trying to convince Grumman that uh, they needed to keep the crew together to, to handle things that might happen in the field and of course the thing they picked was <laughs> was the accident a year and a half before that I, when I blew out the fuses. <laughs> so it was kind of like, if you, if you want, if you want to keep, if, if, if Grumman wants to keep talking to the, to the tier W engineers, um, before we lay them off, <laughs> because, because sure enough, you know, here's the kind of stuff they, you guys at Grumman break. Um, but, uh, so, so let's see. So I was, um, uh, on the engine there for, um, for, from from sixty six all the way up to nineteen seventy, um, I uh, Grumman turned down the uh, the offer and and said uh, you know we'll go without it, and um, and um, and that was um, uh, a month before the Apollo thirteen disaster, and so obviously I had already taken a job um, uh, with. Um, at uh, Ingalls designing the gas turbine um, uh, for the Spruance class ships, but but um, but I wasn't supposed to sh show up there for a month, and, sh and, and so 
I was, uh, Don Harvey was our boss and Don Harvey was down at, uh, at uh, Man Spacecraft Center. And uh, Don has written a really, go online, um, he has written a um, um, synopsis of, of he, he was the one, he was our boss, but he was the one who for every launch was down at the Man Spacecraft Center. And, uh, and he would uh, uh, be the one monitoring the descent engine. And so he was the one, who basically ran back and forth on Apollo 13 to uh, coordinate. Uh, we, we didn't know uh, when we were going to, when the descent engine was going to be used, you know, at a spec for those different firings, whether or not um, the engine was going to blow up. So one of the things that uh, Don would do is he would, uh, he would get the uh, navigational, you know, profiles from the, uh, from the guidance and navigation people uh, that required a burn for so long and at, at certain times and stuff like that at a certain thrust, uh, he would uh, call back the, we were, we were all had a conference room that was all uh, put together for this purpose, all of us in the room together. He would basically ask, uh, he would ask uh, um, uh, Jack Sears people, Arnie Parnell's people, hey, uh, when you look into the computer modeling, will the engine survive that profile? And a number of times it was, nope, not that one. Um, and at the same time, uh, Jack Masiri uh, was looking at uh, all the different uh, chamber test data he had to show um, in, in between the firings and when there was soak back, the thermal soak back, how many cracks were you gonna get? How many cracks could the descent engine survive before the throat was so badly worn that it would affect the performance? Uh, so Don, Don Harvey went back and forth on Apollo 13 for, for, uh, for hours and hours, a couple of days, trying to basically all the time, all the time that um, the astronauts were trying to uh, figure out what profiles they were going to fire for the, for the, uh, the burn halfway there. Um, the, uh, the burn behind the moon was frightening. We had, the, the chambers were badly cracked. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, it was going to require a series of burns that uh, we didn't know the chamber was going to survive. Um, we didn't know uh, when they came back into radio contact uh, behind, from behind the moon, it was going to be dead silence and a pile of space junk or whether they were going to be alive. I mean, it was really, uh, it was, uh, it, it was hard. Uh, to, for a, uh, I'll tell you, there was a bunch of guys, especially uh, down at uh, at uh, Man Spacecraft Center, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Don Harvey and the team and and Jack Masseri and Jack Sears had come up with a series of profiles that were so far off spec that um, uh, it was a miracle that the uh, the engine was able to uh, to um, survive those. It, it, was, it wasn't so much the burns, but it was the, it was the soak back time in between the burns. You know, the engine was designed for when, when the uh, lunar module went into um, uh, orbit at the, and when it got to the moon, you know, it was, it would start to fall, you know, towards the surface of the moon from lunar gravity and got to a certain point, then they would, uh, they would fire a uh, orbit injection burn, I believe it was like 90 seconds, uh, to, to basically um, slow down the fall. Um, and, uh, th and then uh, there would be a, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I think, um, so there was, a, there was a one big long burn. Um, and uh, uh, let me get that straight. Second burn was the long burn. And I, I'm, I'm hesitating because we basically, blew through 18,000 pounds of propellant in, in, uh, in a short time. And, and, and it was, when we landed, we, it, we, it was down to less than a thousand pounds of propellant left, which is why when Neil Armstrong looked out the window and saw all those rocks and he was gonna have to fly sideways, <laughs> we didn't know how much fuel was left, but, but there was enough fuel and ox to, uh, to fly sideways. So that the engine, the engine design was, it was that that was a ten thousand pound thrust engine that weighed two hundred and seventy pounds. It was incredibly light, and it was designed to be you know um, um, 
extremely weight efficient, but that basically took away from uh, from uh, from margin, and uh, so we you know we we couldn't add extra wall thickness or or extra ablation and stuff like that, um, and uh, so um, it uh, the uh, the effort that uh, that the team went through, uh, especially you know led by Don Harvey uh, down at the um, anyway if if you want to if um, there's a paper, Don wrote a paper. Uh, and it's a thing, it's an AIAA paper, and it goes into um, his time uh, at uh, you know, for at, for every launch, and 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 there were you know interesting things like when when Apollo eight um, the engine was first time the engine was fired in uh, in, in in space, um, but it was also it was fired in space. When we fired it, uh, all the pressure <laughs> pressure gauges went crazy, and it it uh, we had to, we had a burp, and trying to figure out what it was, and uh, you know I, I was the junior guy on that team to kind of figure it out. Uh, was was the uh, the fuel and ox valves um, on the shutoff valves had different diameter, um, um, you know, holes in it, if you will, flow passages, and it was a and it was and it was a twenty millisecond uh, delay built into the actuators of the, of the fuel and ox, so that if the uh, um, the the, uh, uh, the ox would not start flowing uh, before the, uh, the fuel has already start flowing. So you, you when you know it's a it's a hypergolic engine, you know, and it's a uh, it's a uh, you know. Um, um, and, and it, it, uh, if it, uh, they aren't sequenced, it, you, you're going to get an explosion. So um, the, um, let's see, I'm starting to go down rabbit holes here. Hey, um, hey Don? Yes. Actually, Don Harvey is, uh, is also online. Uh, that's for, for Ken's information, too. Uh, I don't see his image, I think, but, uh, but he is amongst the the uh the people online right now yeah he's not my audio there he is yeah do you have my audio uh yeah. yes we have your audio well you have my uh video and also uh, yours your picture dropped out mine dropped out <laughs> okay. mine's off too we have to we have to start the video at the bottom bottom left of the screen and uh, also, the the host has to uh, acknowledge the the video. So, okay. So, uh, Gary, why don't I uh, let's see? So, I, I I can I can go uh, on for hours about how much fun I had as a young engineer on on both the Grubbin side and here. And, and I think it's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, going going to talk? Okay, am I on? Yeah, you're on. We see. Okay, yeah, yeah, Gary. I want to thank you for inviting me to this, and uh, I hope you and your family, and Jerry and Gene and his family, and John and your family, that you're, you're surviving this crisis right now. I'm uh, kind of self quarantined at uh, Carlsbad by the sea, where I'm dead every day, and I can, uh, but I do get out. In fact, I turned down a mountain bike ride this morning to be on this. So, uh, but I felt it was worth the time. Uh, I want to uh, give you a, a quick summary. I'm not going to drag on very long. Uh, I joined uh, STL in 1962, right at the beginning of uh, some of the design work on the uh, London descent engine. And I was assigned the design and development of the flow control valves, which um, I lived with through the entire uh, program. It, uh, the design of those valves was quite a challenge, maintaining the, uh, the pressure drop controls, uh, guaranteeing the cavitation as required, uh, and also all the materials, different materials we had to use to, to combat the corrosion as well as uh, weight, we had aluminum, 6AL, 4V titanium, and all, various uh, stainless steels in that valve to all with special purposes. There's some tough bearings in there that had to be a very hard steel. And, uh, it was just a, uh, 
a long design process that uh, turned out well. The seals also, we had, I think we had Viton on the fuel side and uh, um, can't remember what was on the other side, the, on the oxidizer side, but it was a different uh, different material that would, st would stand the, the uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Well, I, uh, I attribute the success to this um, Lemdes engine almost entirely on Jerry Elvin, the way he led the team, such an honorable, competent person. And then backing him up, we had uh, Pete Stoudhammer and Joe Miller were other management people I worked with that were just, just plain outstanding. Uh, and also I felt uh, Art Grant and the management uh, stepped forward when they when they uh, committed to the design and of the, uh, the construction of the Capistrano test site, which turned out to be kind of a playground for rocket engineers. It was a, just a beautiful location and all new equipment. You couldn't ask for any better. But uh, back to the flights, I spent most of my time um, in the latter years on supporting the Apollo 11 through 17. And uh, John went through, uh, covered quite a bit on Apollo 11. But yeah, I was watching uh, on my monitor all the parameters. I had to, when I checked into the uh, propulsion room, checked into building 45, uh, Houston, they told me, uh, you know, once you're in here, if there's a crisis, you don't leave until it's over. And I said, well, who would want to leave? <laughs> anyway, I went up to, I was assigned a, uh, a monitor that displayed the entire propulsion system, including uh, the drum and feed systems, all the pressures, quantities, flow rates, chamber pressure, everything you want to know is mixture ratio. But in addition, uh, the room was shared with um, the guidance control people. So also on my screen, I had all the parameters of the uh, um, space time variables, you name it. I knew the descent rates, the uh, forward velocities, downward velocities, uh, you name it, it's all displayed there. It's quite a bit, of, a lot of information to digest. But, but when uh, I, I can recall when, when um, Neil Armstrong was coming in for that landing, that, that he was very gentle moving those piddles in that flow control valve and then the injector very so gently to get the exact thrust that he wanted to uh, make a soft landing, which he, he did. And uh, my recollection in reading it, a lot of the uh, works from the other astronauts that the um, landing, the engine performance and landing was extremely smooth. On top of that, the um, mixture ratio was well, well within any limits. Uh, but I was really surprised how, how well the uh, flow control valves control that mixture ratio. But again, when we uh, did all the assembly work, you know, we had to calibrate each of those valves, and then we had to synchronize the valves, mount them to the soft throttle actually, and then synchronize that system with the with the injector. So that, uh, as Jerry explained, you got the right velocity going through those slots for that particular thrust setting, and uh, it uh, worked out well because the uh, the astronauts always had enough propellant to land. They, if they missed on that, if they missed on those setups, uh, they could very well have run short. Now back to Apollo 13. Um, at about, uh, well, on the third, um, April 13th, uh, I was attending a class at the University of Southern California in advanced thermodynamics, otherwise known as statistical thermodynamics. And about a little after 8 p.m., I got a knock at the door at our classroom, and it was the campus police. And uh, they asked for me, and I stepped out, and they said, you have an important phone call. Those kind of shook me up because about three months earlier, I had the same thing happen, and someone in the family died. And I thought, oh, man, what's happened? Well, I, they took me over to the uh, campus station, and I talked to Joe Miller on the phone, and he filled me in on just what had happened, and I had instructions to pack up the next morning and, and uh, head out to Houston. 
Well, I already had plane tickets to fly there because I was going to be there for the landing. So just move those up and and uh, make, I made contact with Mike Fay, who's a thermal analyst that I dealt with on the uh, on the various burn profiles that occurred that they were that were being proposed. And uh, so I'd give him a call and he'd load up the computer. But uh, I was always concerned about those those punch cards because that's how you fed the how you fed the um, computer. And once in a while the computer would chew up these you know, card reader would get chew up these cards and, and we didn't want that to happen. But anyway, uh, things worked out well. But Mike was uh Hey, Don, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just hold on for just a second here. Uh, yeah. A little housekeeping exercise. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've asked Ken to uh, to spotlight your image, your video, but we're still on the uh, on one of the uh, charts on the Apollo 13 mission summary. So, um, so Ken, why don't you go ahead and and it looks like all of the videos got turned off, uh, except those of us that got have gotten returned back on again. So okay, so you only turn back on Ken. Well, the the, imp the important one is to to let's go ahead and spotlight Don. Yeah, I did it. I did it. Yeah. Okay, but it's but it's still showing the uh, the charts. Oh, so you don't want the chart now? Okay. No. Okay. So how about this? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> now, now we're seeing everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that. Yeah, what's, yeah. what's interesting also in. Well, let's, in the let's go ahead and, and spotlight uh, Don for the entire screen. So, or maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm on gallery view. Yeah, I think that fine. happened. Yeah, I think you are on gallery view. That's why. Video video. There we go. Yeah. Hey, everybody that's, that's not see, that's seeing the whole, gal the whole gallery. What you want to do is go to the upper right corner, and there's a there's kind of a checkerboard that looks like a like the gallery view, and uh, push it so that it says uh, sp um, speaker view. I forgot what the other one was now. Yeah, it's a speaker view. There's speaker view and the gallery view. Okay, so it was my problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Don. Uh, and, and yeah. one, one more housekeeping. Yes. When he finishes up, uh, if if somebody else wants in, then they should wave their hand. That's right. But um, but I think I'll proceed over to those to chart number eight. I think it is. Nice Hawaiian shirt, Don. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The host has the individual videos turned off. Right. So he can do that at, at his pleasure. But okay. Well, right. he can he turn on the videos? He can do the muting. So it's okay now, right? It's okay now. Yes. Okay. Uh, Gary, do you want me to put up to back slides number eight? Yeah, sorry for the phone call. I think this, uh, I tuned it down, so now it's okay. <laughs> I guess I'm muted again. No, you, I can hear you. I can hear okay. everybody. Okay, so yeah, do turn on everybody's videos and, uh, and, and we'll basically uh, mute everybody except uh, the speaker who's currently Don and why don't you leave me on too. And then when when uh, when Don finishes up, then just seamlessly go over to uh, slide eight. Okay. And hey, Don, I really like that image in the, over your over your shoulder there. Is that here? <laughs> the, the one over the right shoulder isn't, isn't that the uh, the descent yeah. engine running? Yeah. How about the uh, the picture? Yeah, the picture. Yeah, Apollo eleven. Yeah. Right. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, some of the other things that I did there at the uh, propulsion room was that I'd be asked by NASA various questions like total impulse. You know, everything I was done, the, all the calculations I did there were with a slide rule. And, and it wasn't a matter of five minutes or 10 minutes, it was like 30 seconds. We need to know this, need to know that. And, uh, 
it uh, it got hectic at times. And then sometimes you sit there and just wait and wait and wait. But you know, the uh, the whole experience is kind of a blur to me now. I was in that room a long time, days, and I don't recall how I went to bed, how I ate. I can't remember any of that. It's just kind of strange. But in details, I can remember everything on that screen and, and what was going on. But uh, not that. Very peculiar. But, yeah, indeed. Uh, Around 120 hours of mission time, the crew was commanded to, to take a, a sleep break. Everybody had really pushed things uh, to the extremes of exhaustion. Yeah. I think I think I must have gone into another room and, and laid out somewhere still. I just couldn't believe it. But uh, what a important event. And I guess that was probably the highlight where it was supported at it, that. Uh, a particular uh, crisis. And I'm going to hand it to the thousands of other people that were contributing in the same manner all around the uh, all around the country, including several people back at the Space Park. Uh, a name that hasn't been mentioned is Don Webb. He was a critical part of this. Uh, remember Arnie Hoffman, who passed away, but he was, a, I think, a top-notch project manager on the Lindy. Uh, just a lot of good people mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm really really happy with this with the situation with our test our test facility down at Capistrano the way that uh, that came about and I can remember going in grants office and seeing two photographs for November of 1963 with bare ground down there. And then the following March, just five or six months later, there was a complete test site operational. I thought that was fantastic. Hey, so try to do that one nowadays. More, one more housekeeping interruption. Ken, why don't you unmute Stan, uh, John Stamrak and Jerry Elvram as well, and they they may have a conversation with uh, with Don. Okay. Okay, well, do you have anything to say? <laughs> well, carry on. Go ahead so, and talk until, until one of them just chooses to interrupt you. <laughs> but, you know, all, the, all the rest of the, the Apollo's uh, 14 through 17 things went so well that uh, it was uh, too routine. I, I just. Uh, just so so pleased with the performance of our engine, how well that uh, performed. And I attribute it all really to mm -hmm. Jerry Elvin, who's my mentor and probably the mentor of several other engineers there at uh, SDL TRW. So well, Don, this is John. I think uh, you, we can't underestimate the. Um, um, since since that engine was designed on such a thick profile, your ability to basically um, handle uh, one proposed flight profile after another so quick, and 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 it was you know we all we we we've all seen crack chambers that uh, you know that that that. that what happens when you fire it too much in the in the wrong way, and and uh, that that was genius. You 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 uh, work working with uh, Arnie Parnell's people was you know fantastic. And when they came out behind the moon in one piece, the whole country took a big, good deep breath. Thank Jerry, you, Jerry. Jerry, you're unmuted now too, so feel free whenever it's convenient. Okay. Uh, Anyway, so anyway, Don, I, I think you know those of us who understood how how tight the design requirements were because of what that engine had to do, and it had to weigh almost nothing. It had it had to be versatile. It had to do, uh, and and um, the fact that you were able to um, on the fly um, make major changes to the uh, uh, the engine profile was impressive. 
Yeah, I think one thing that we can say too, there, there were actually, there was actually a secondary issue about when can you restart the engine, and that was the fuel, because when the engine fired, uh, the fuel flow and the ox flow kept the uh, injector at a at a below boiling point temperature, but when you uh, completed the firing and did the thermal soak back. There was a time where if you put fuel or ox into that injector, uh, it would decompose by itself before it got to the chamber and could be extremely rough in starting. Mm -hmm. well, and, and Don was the guy telling him the timing of what could happen without the engine blowing up. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Bill King tells stories about that as well. Well, I remember when they did come up with that left, that one profile, the, the actual uh, burn that put over, oh, I think about 800 feet a second and more to accelerate back to, to, to Earth. But uh, the question of that, the char depth came up, and of course, Mike Fay ran the analysis and said there was a good half inch virgin material calculated by a thermal model. I could recall that we ran a test down at the test site where one of the stand valves failed prematurely and the burn was about the same length of time. And I asked, I called down a, a test, uh, either Redondo Beach or Capistrano, I can't remember which I called. I said, go find that chamber and see if they, uh, if they still have it. And uh, actually they found it and they had, they had actually had sectioned it. So they found the section and found that there was about this, it justified the uh, uh, agreed with the analysis that there was about a half inch virgin material. There. And so then I got thinking back later, I said, Well, I think what's happened really is the guys that designed that model took that data point and forced it into their model. So I think that's probably why those two agreed. So, so, right. both. yep, but uh, anyway, that's uh. That was a good, yeah. good go ahead. Yeah, people don't people don't realize how close we came. Yeah. You know that 500 feet per second, approximately, that they accelerated coming out from behind the moon. It was over 800. It was 800. Yeah. That that also had another limit that it had to deal with, and that was the uh, the heat shield on the on the Apollo command module, uh, where there was a velocity limit to that uh, uh, to that heat shield. It had been tested a few times to escape velocity, but they're gonna be pushing it higher. And of course the, uh, the energy that's being absorbed is goes up with the square of the velocity. So uh, it, uh, you know, there might be like three alternate uh, orbital trajectories that you could do coming back one super hot, one nominal, and the one that they chose to do, which is somewhere between there. So, uh, unfortunately, we, we have one of the one of the uh, heat shield analysts in the uh, Aero Alumni group, but and he was going to talk about the, the the Apollo heat shield at, at another time. But uh, he chose not to check in with the with the Zoom today, so I don't think he's on board. He wasn't in the in the group that I saw. But, uh, but you know, the entire the entire spacecraft was designed optimally, and the thing that you have to remember about optimal design is that if you violate any of the conditions of it, you can break things. You're pretty much guaranteed to break things. So we had to find out where could you go off spec that was still within survivable limits, which is what we've been talking about. Over and out. <laughs> that's right. No, that's point spot on. You know, I don't know if you heard. I uh, um, I, I had to go to the Cape uh, early in the, the Apollo 13 uh, delivery days. Eight when they were, were loading everything in the, uh, on, onto the uh, launch vehicle and uh, the shutoff valve 
uh, flunked, the, flunked the leak test. <laughs> so um, so I, I went down with uh, <coughs> my technician, Sam LaFada, and we went and uh, had to put a bunny suit on because uh, they were loading with propellant. And I had, we had to go change the, uh, change the ball and, and the cartridge. Well, four years ago, uh, when I was given the Howard Hughes Award to Jim Lovell, I said, you know, when you came back, I said, you, uh, you basically uh, dropped the uh, lunar module into, into the Pacific. I said, you didn't have any, any, um, Memorabilia. any souvenir. So I gave him, I gave him the ball, I gave him the ball and this, and the cartridge seal that came out of his engine before launch. And he got, I mean, he, he's been carrying that around everywhere. It came out of the engine that, that, that saved his butt, as he said. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we're ready to go over to the, uh, to the, to the other slides? Sure. Yeah, I'll bring up any other subject you want to do right now, but here we go. Okay, so we're going to slide eight, right? There it is. Okay, now we're going back to the basic uh, mission that uh, and and the and the story about the Apollo thirteen launch through splashdown. And so, something that I oh this I have to give credit to to Larry Corb for preparing this set of charts at the 45th anniversary uh, engineer's presentation that we did five years ago. And um, so the, uh, the, the launch did not go without any uh, anomalies. And the, the, the astronauts pretty much had in their understanding that that hey you know when we were designing things we were de designing them to five nines five reliability that means that you could only allow statistically five failures in a million unfortunately we had 25 million no uh, we had we had uh, two no we had we had 30 million parts i think between 25 and 30 million parts you do that little multiplication out, and all of a sudden you've got some something like 25 to 30 expected failures per launch, per mission. So they pretty much counted on having some kind of anomaly, and, and they would typically say, well, that was the launch anomaly. And uh, what happened in, on this one was that during the S2, <coughs> when they were uh, going into translunar trajectory, they had a, uh, a pogo hiccup. And it was pretty exciting, 34 Gs plus and minus for a few, for a fraction of a second. No, at 16 hertz per second, 16 cycles per second. And later on, they figured it out that that was uh, amplified by the turbo pump cavitation. And the, the, the engine frame on that launch vehicle had a five excursion. Gary, can you tell us what a pogo is? A pogo is uh, very much like the pogo stick. When a, when, a, when a rocket engine and propulsion system goes unstable, uh, for instance, simple answer, the fuel sloshes down and it increases the pressure going into the engine, the thrust goes up, and the the vehicle accelerates then at some critical frequency if that thrust goes down if the well the, the vehicle will will bounce like a pogo stick and at that 16 hertz uh the propellant will depressurize lose pressure head and uh, at the critical frequency, those amplification, those those displacements amplify, and uh, they can very rapidly go out of control and cause some structural limit to be exceeded. So, uh, it's a very nasty consideration, and it's not easy to deal with uh, uh, when we 
when we repurposed the lunar module descent engine for the uh, Thor Delta straight eight, uh, we modified the supports for the engine and we modified the valving and the, uh, the fuel uh, fuel routes in the valves, yeah. Uh, so that to simplify things, to lighten the engine and to, uh, because we didn't need the variable thrust. But still the, the uh, you know, the, the pinhole left the engine being very stable throughout that pressure range. But the structure nonetheless would oscillate. And so after the first mission, we had to redesign and uh, modify that. And I think that part of the answer immediately was we just ballasted the engine, just detuned the engine. So anyway, um, you, can, you can all read. Uh, am I on the, I, I guess I'm spotlighted, right? You're, yes, you're spotlighted. Okay. So, Anyway, there, there was quite a pressure excursion on that, uh, on that one. Go ahead and move to the next screen and then I'll be, oh, no, for me. <laughs> I don't care, you can put it up for everybody. We don't need to show my face for this. So anyway, um, that translunar burn for the S4B was five minutes, uh, almost six minutes long to get to the escape velocity. And uh, then the, the key event of the Apollo 13 event, uh, 13 mission was that the, the oxygen tank exploded. Uh, they had just finished a, a television uh, presentation, which practically nobody in the world saw because none of the ma major networks carried it. They thought that uh, the, the networks thought that, hey, this, this is prime time. We've been to the moon before. This is old hat. There's no big deal about this. Let's just get rid of this uh, weightlessness show and make money. So they finished that uh, program, that that uh, the, that first from the from the Apollo, and uh, then they they did a little burp and uh, burp uh, of a orbital correction, and then it was time to stir the oxygen tanks. And so Swigert being the command module pilot, uh, pushed the button to control that. And uh, moments later, the, the oxygen tank exploded. We can get to that later, but the, but the reason it exploded turned out to be that sometime earlier in the test cycle, the uh, the th thermostats that controlled that had been shorted by a 65 volt signal that was put on in accidentally during the test cycle. So it uh, it froze that thermos that thermostat to a closed position, and somehow in the course of further uh, testing, we never tested that particular thermostat for its thermal cycle. So um, anyway, the oxygen tank was overheated by that, uh, that action and it uh, caused the, the tank to blow, to blow up. Um, if everybody else is seeing it, they, you can move ahead. Otherwise I can read my own chart here. So the, the challenge for NASA, in fact, I think this is really good if you do put that up, the next screen, because it's an eye chart, but um, I'm not going to read everything there, and other people will be able to read it faster than I can talk. But anyway, the big challenge was 
hey, there's no other vehicle that can rescue them. The fuel cells lost their fuel source, so there's no electricity. Also, they're not putting out water from the fuel cells. And they, they didn't know how much damage had been done to the service module. Uh, some 13 minutes after the explosion, kind of a significant number, uh, Lovell looked out the window and he saw the, the debris field around the spacecraft. And that sobered everybody up and they knew that they had not had uh, the first the first thing you always think about when you when you see all the gauges going wrong and every exploded is hey those instrumentation people again <laughs> so uh, when they saw the debris field and and with all the noises and things that were going on they knew that it was not instrumentation but anyway, they lost a lot of oxygen. And because the command module was docked to the, uh, to the limb, they couldn't do a EVA to investigate what had happened there. And they were on a orbital transition, uh, orbital f f trajectory. So they needed to modify that to avoid missing the Earth on the way back. Next slide. And the only thing about that is, if you look at, at the situation, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. It didn't happen after they'd expended all the propellant from the, from the limb. They couldn't have done that at all if they'd been on their way back from the moon. or. But now they had to survive for more than 87 hours on a normal path. I'm not sure what they ended up doing, whether that's the 87 hours that they actually did with the accelerated return, or if it's, uh, if it's what would have been if they hadn't. But Gene Krantz, of course, came up with that spectacular model for, for all of NASA, and particularly Apollo 13. Uh, Failure is not an option. Uh, so next screen. So the crew survival, the first thing to do was to shut down the command module, which was losing all of its power and needed to have power for the reentry. So they were going to move the astronauts over to the LEM, which had to be powered up guidance and information transferred and all kinds of other activities and move the food over there and everything else so that they could hibernate in the uh, in the limb and the question is how many things can you turn off in the command module they they had quite an exercise with that and how many things do you need to power with the with the limb so I, I really commend the uh, Tom Hanks movie, Apollo 13, as being the source of a significant part of my knowledge about this mission. Uh, anyway, uh, let's go ahead on to the next screen. Now, the obvious things that you need to have for crew survival include oxygen. You need to, when you, when you breathe that oxygen, you create carbon dioxide. And there's a, a very dramatic story uh, about what do you, how do you take the carbon dioxide out of the air? Uh, at that time, the uh, the, the canisters for the uh, lithium hydroxide in the LEM and the command module were different. One was square and the other was circular. And you can't put a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. So uh, uh, that's one of the very real life stories that was in the Apollo 13 movie. 
uh, in fact, there is a, an Apollo 13 uh, training aid that's available from NASA, which invites STEM students or, or managers of other projects to relive the circumstances there and go through and, and do the uh, logical development of, of the re recovery mission that was actually done. They actually ended up uh, building a, a, a kludge adapter for the uh, uh, for the for the for the uh, canisters just in time as the uh, as the carbon dioxide level was getting up to a level where they where the astronauts were having some difficulty following the instructions. And then the hypothermia. Uh, there wasn't really anything to be done about that. All they could do was barbecue roll the spacecraft to try to keep the uh, the space the the lunar module cabin as warm as the sun could do it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that's pretty cold. Next screen. So the the cabin temperature actually dropped to thirty eight degrees. Now, most of us would think that water would also be critical, but in point of fact, both food and water are things you can live for seven days without. Uh, but in the process of rationing their water and their food, the crew lost 31 pounds between the three of them in that only seven day, well, no, only four days uh, after the, after the mission, after the, uh, abort. But the food was all freeze-dried and you needed to have hot water to reconstitute it or else it tasted really crummy. So um, I don't know if you've seen the astronaut ice cream or not, but it's available from various places like uh, like the Columbia Memorial Space Center that's uh, in the uh, in Downey. Um, it's also I think available at the uh, California Science Center. Okay the next screen and actually that tastes pretty good without uh, reconstituting but it's better if you have water. <laughs> Limited amount of, of, uh, of, of food and water available though. Okay, so I don't know quite why my screens don't show the same, my, my charts don't show the same thing as we have here, but this is a really good, I must have slipped it out somewhere. Anyway, um, so the navigation, uh, they use the, I think they use the abort system guidance system. Um, I think I've messed the, I've, I've fouled up the, uh, the acronym but it's better than the initial acronym that, uh, that Grumman was using. That was backup guidance system, commonly called bugs. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they changed the name to AGS to <laughs> reduce <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, so they, they did the trajectory around the moon, modifi modified, um, and then uh, interestingly, the uh, the velocity of the spacecraft can be very precisely determined at any time uh, by radio transmission. You just uh, look at the amount of uh, of Doppler effect that's that's involved in that that you read in the signals, and uh, the, the velocity is, is very accurately determinable. So that between that and optical or radar, uh, which are really hard to do out there, tracking, uh, they're, they're actually able to get a very accurate determination of the, of the tra trajectory. Uh, one other issue that came up that's not in this chart was that uh, 
on the way back, Swigert noticed that the trajectory that was that they were on was going to miss the the, long, the landing site. Was going to miss the the, the window. And uh, when he when he told people about that, as they were figuring that out on at Mission Control, uh, it turns out that the reason they were making the error was that the people on the ground were all doing calculations with the wrong command module mass. So they'd anticipated bringing back a pile of rocks. So, uh, so they had to move some ballast from the, from the lunar module to the command module uh, during the, the, before the re-entry re -entry phase. Anyway, um, they had a, a few problems that I didn't know about. Um, turns out that the lunar module helium vessel burst disk ruptured, affecting the, the, uh, the roll. So the PTC roll was established, but it, but it had to be recorrected. And I didn't know there was a hydrogen explosion in a battery. Um, but uh, I have to give Larry, credit, Larry Korb credit on this because he was the materials and sciences engineer at, uh, at, at, Nor at North American, at Rockwell. And um, and so he was involved in virtually all of these uh, mission analyses. Uh, so anyway, um, on re-entry, there was another issue about uh, how do you establish the re-entry. And the, uh, the thing was that the LEM had not been jettisoned. Now, ordinarily, the limb should have been jet jettisoned at, uh, at, the, at the moon. But um, in this instance, they had to first jettison the, the, the service module, since it was not really contributing anything anyway. And they kept the limb as long as they could, because the final amp of a final kilowatt of a kilowatt hour of power that they recovered that they needed they they got by running a, a cable between the limb and the uh, the command module and sapping uh, energy out of the uh, out of the limb that that was still there in order to uh, power up the, the, the command module again. Now, the other thing was that they had to uh, uh, decide how to operate the limb remotely, or actually to cause it to, uh, to separate from the, uh, from the command module. So the first thing to do was to not install the, uh, the the upper hatch in the lunar module, and then to uh, make sure that the pressure in the in the lunar module was enough to provide rocket thrust to separate the the limb from the from the command module during reentry. So that also involved the an orientation, you needed to figure out how much pressure you needed to provide a certain amount of uh, acceleration, difference in velocity, delta V, to the limb, and in which direction to send it. And so uh, University of Toronto apparently was involved in calculating that. So the Canadians got involved too. Okay, uh, next screen. So now the failure analysis was primarily analytical because they didn't have the articles in hand. But 
um, the the cause of the explosion was was determined to be that when they had dropped the tank by by two inches, one of the bolts did not have to be. Uh, oh, because one of the bolts did not ha was not completely removed. So I think they changed out that tank to the to the spare tank or next next vehicle tank, and then they had to do a um, a test of it. So they what is it? So the fifty percent oxygen boil off test took minutes on tank one, but eight hours to get down to 92% on, on tank two. In other words, the tank could not relieve safety valve pressure and the astronauts, an astronaut signed off on the uh, manufacturing view, MR. And then the cape switched from 22 volts to 65 volts on the tank heater to try to speed up the operations though it was allowed by the design change, the heater switch that was in there had not been changed to accommodate it. So uh, they used a Model A thermostat when they meant to be, when they, when they were supposed to be on Model B. So the switch welded in the on position could not be turned off and nobody figured it out. So it melted the insulation and resulting in bare wires, resulting in a, an arc. Um, okay, so the post-flight analysis verified all this. Next page. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now one of the things that's kind of in the legends of Apollo 13 is, well, why did we fly Apollo 13. And uh, Lovell did a very good explanation of it in the movie. It says, hey, 13 comes after 12. <laughs> so the, uh, but the, but the launch was that it was timed exactly at 1313. Good, good PR there. And the tank exploded on April 13th. Uh, the thing that exploded was the cryogenic tank, which has 13 letters. What was in the tank, tank supercritical oxygen, also 13 letters. Where was the tank located? In the service module, 13 letters. What was the cause of the explosion? The Teflon ignited, 13 letters. Where was the spacecraft? It exposed, it, it, it uh, exploded 205,000 miles from the Earth at a position where the lunar gravity was 13 times that of the Earth's gravitational pull. How long did it take Lovell to figure that out? 13 minutes. So before we start. <laughs> okay, carrying on with the 13 tripiopa. Just catiodophobia. The time it took for the number one tank to lose oxygen was 13 times 10 minutes. The astronauts' first names added up to 13 letters. When I'm trying to think, oh Ken, yeah, Ken Mattingly would have would have messed that one up. <laughs> when the astronauts transferred to the rescue ship, the the ship played band of the played. Uh, Age of Aquarius, but when they picked up in the rescue ship, 13 letters. And that's 13 13s, he says. Note that Superstitious also has 13 letters. And the Columbia failed on the 113th flight of shuttle. Is 13 unlucky? No, the astronauts, Apollo 13 astronauts made it back. And his briefing had 13 pages. Oh. <laughs> Way too much fun. Yeah, I'll see. <laughs> okay, next page. Well, this is a picture that should have been included in the, 
should have been up when uh, when when Jerry was talking near the beginning of the meeting. Uh, this is the view of the uh, lunar module descent engine. Uh, Jerry or 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 John or uh, or Don, anybody that wants to pipe in about any details about that, welcome to it. Well, let's go to the next screen. Because uh, this is a, a, a poster that uh, TRW was putting out in uh, from 1966 through 70, 71 or 73. And uh, uh, in this, they they demonstrate they talk about the last 10 miles are on us meaning that the uh, the orbit of the of the later uh, apollos initially they started out with a 50 mile altitude um, uh, around the uh, circular orbit around the moon and descended from there on the on the descent engine but uh, for Apollo 13 and subsequent, they added a, a burn of the service module to reduce the uh, altitude of the, well, the, the, uh, the paraloon, I guess, the close to, to the close to the moon part of the orbit down to uh, 10 or 12 miles. So uh, from, for that 10 miles, the lunar module descent engine is the is the engine is what's what they're riding on mm -hmm. so uh, on the opposite side of the moon from where they're going to land they fire the engine for something on the order of 30 seconds might be longer i don't remember numbers on that but uh, but that puts them into an orbit that basically is a is a uh, it crashes into the surface and then they um, when they when they come around to the other side of the of the of the uh, of the moon they do a descent burn and that's the continuous burn that uh, uh, that terminates in expending all the fuel except maybe a thousand pounds if you have done it right sometimes less if you run into a, a field of boulders. <laughs> but in the case of Apollo 13, it was actually 300,000 miles, 80,000, uh, 40,000 miles to the moon, I think it was, from where, they, where the explosion happened and then the 240,000 miles back and change. I don't know how the rest of the change worked out, but anyway, uh, so, so they modified that. In this case, I didn't find that, so I, I modified the, the picture myself. The last 10 miles are on us, but for Apollo 13, it was 300,000 miles. So let's get to the next screen. And, oh, okay. Well, We'll we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes, but uh, okay. So this is another chart that's a stray that uh, uh, that is from another presentation, and uh, so they uh, this talks about the uh, uh, the test procedure being modified. Uh, to allow a higher voltage, quicker, um, quicker drying out or emptying the tank. Um, but the uh, uh, but this one switch did not get upgraded. So um, yeah, the other warning signs during the test were unheated and the tank damaged was damaged from eight hours of overheating and it was a potential bomb the next time it was <coughs> so 
It exploded 205,000 miles from the Earth. Next screen. Ah, this is the one I was talking about. Okay, I don't know if we can read this. It's another eye chart, but uh, this is the towing bill that Grumman Aerospace Corporation submitted to NASA. I understand that there was actually also a similar bill submitted from uh, from from TRW at the time, but it's pretty reasonable actually. Uh, the uh, the inspection of the of the damage was only charged twenty dollars, and uh, the towing bill was only a dollar a mile, uh, three hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, some of the other, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, what the altitude statement there was, but they consider that to be a twenty-four thousand, thirty-four thousand dollar bill. They charge the battery only five dollars, and air conditioning moderately, and the hotel bill four hundred dollars, forty dollars a day per astronaut. So something like $330,000 total bill requested. I understand that the that NASA did not pay that bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have a number of other charts that are not particularly to the point. Um, those include uh, a blank conclusions sheet so we can, we can, let's have the, uh, let's have the, the, the other speakers come on board and, and have whatever they would like to do in terms of conclusions. We can also bring up the President Kennedy's mission statement. There's a picture of the, uh, why, why, don't we, why don't we step on through those things for right now? That mission statement, of course, is one of the most amazingly effective statements ever, because indeed you could talk to a janitor and ask him what he was doing, what his what his job was, and he could he could quote Kennedy's commitment to get to the moon and safely return to the Earth in this decade. So, um, the next screen is a. Uh, is what it looks like through the, the side hatch. And uh, those are the second generation uh, crew couches there. When I first arrived at, uh, yeah, when I first arrived at, at North American, there were solid aluminum crew couches. And um, they were supported by crushable honeycomb struts that you see vertically in the in the front of the image here. Uh, those those couches occupied an awful lot of space when they were stowed. You could disconnect the the couches from the from the struts there, but they occupied a lot of space in the command module. So anyway, Weber Aircraft developed a a more modular set of couches, and uh, they these these couches folded off into uh, a large suitcase, or two or three two or three medium-sized suitcases, and gave the astronauts space to to actually fly around inside the command module. Uh, those struts are very interesting too. Uh, the modification in those struts was instead of crushing honeycomb, they put uh, uh, soft metal donuts between two sliding cylinders. So when the toroids were, uh, were compressed by, by installation, uh, they produced a lot of friction. Well, no, they they produced enough friction to cause them to roll. And so when the toroid, when the donut uh, made a complete revolution, 
there was a very high strain energy expended in that, and there was no restoring force. So if the, uh, if, if the astronauts landed hard, the couches in the first instance would have slid back almost freely. In fact, we had some, uh, some, some brake shoes inside the cylinder to, uh, to keep it from being a completely free fall. But these, these struts with the toroids uh, worked full strength, full force uh, anytime you moved them. And a little sidelight curiosity, uh, when we threw the command module into the, uh, uh, into the swimming pool first, the, it was actually what's called a boilerplate. It was a steel shell welded up to uh, match the con configuration. The first test on that caused the entire boilerplate to practically explode, break the, break the seams. They, they just hadn't done a, a complete weld job on all the seams. Later on, when we uh, improved that situation and tried throwing it into the sand pit the other direction, the accelerations on the crew couch head were uh, the head of the astronauts were limited by specification and by the thicknesses of those joints, of those struts, to 69 Gs on the head. It turns out 69 Gs is the amount of acceleration that the, uh, the flight surgeon did in his acceleration test on the rocket, te uh, on the rocket sled. So that was uh, uh, an incredible number. Uh, I, I've always marveled at the, at the fact that a well-restrained well person can withstand that much acceleration eyeballs in. Yeah. But um, another real curiosity about those couches, the, uh, the original uh, couch had what we call rat traps, which would uh, go up around your, you know, a cable that would go around your, the foot to, uh, to keep you from having the feet flailed outwards and hitting the instrument panel, because it's pretty close. Uh, when we redesigned the couches, somebody had done some skiing, I think, in a spademan binding or something like that. And the uh, and the the astronauts' heels were restrained by just popping the popping the heels into between a pair of uh, of cylinders. So when the astronaut would land, when they when they would land. They would brace pu pushing hard against the the feet, and between their own energy of pushing it down and the uh, and the and the clamps, the uh, the astronauts could not only uh, avoid flailing their legs, but they could also uh, uh, get out of the thing which made them much more comfortable. Uh, next screen is the command module geometry, launched at 13,000 pounds. And- oh, Is it Gary? Someone raised his hand. Do you want to take question or- later? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll mute him. Uh, Gus, you raised the hand. Do you have any question? Just to see if you're going to mail these charts uh, to those who signed up for the call. Gary? Uh, I don't think there's anything private about them. Um, I guess you can email me a request to do so. I don't think everybody wants to receive uh, a couple of megabytes of, of, of uh, PowerPoint or PDF slides. But. Uh, we'll do it, thanks. Okay. Next screen. Oh, that you is can that see right? there, Command module. 
right here, yeah, you can see the probe in the, at the front of the command module. Uh, that's actually in a compressed position there for launch to fit within the, the cone, uh, the, the conical aero cover. Um, and I worked a little bit on that. Um, the demonstration of that were really amazing. Anyway, um, below that, there's a frustrum of a cone that is concealing the, uh, the uh, with an ablative cover to protect it from launch, from, from reentry. And you can see the, uh, uh, go to the circle just at the top there. The, the circle on just above the, uh, the command module side hatch, just above that, yeah, um, is the uh, drug chute mortar. There's a pilot chute mortar that fires out uh, uh, small parachutes uh, for each of the each of the others, and then there's a drug chute mortar that fires out a large, um, well, people size uh, parachute, which then pulls out the large parachutes, which are the uh, the hash mark just be, just to below and to the right of where Ken's image is, uh, highlighter is. So anyway, um, worked on some of those things and a lot on that side hatch. Uh, but anyway, let's go to the next stream. There's a side hatch. It's displayed in the Smithsonian. That's off Apollo 11, I believe. Next screen. Oh, the, the, let's go back to that. Because when I came on board at, uh, at North Rockwell, North American Aviation at that time, uh, the, there was a different hatch on there and it, it was a pressure activated hatch that, uh, uh, that was a two-piece hatch. The inner hatch was uh, had a, a linkage, kind of like what you see running around the outside of that hatch, uh, that could be turned loose with a with a few turns of a of a uh, of a <laughs> of a speed wrench. And then the outer hatch um, was ablative. Well, this that that inner hatch, the pressure hatch, pulled out and came inside the spacecraft and was stowed somewhere else. And the outer hatch was a, an ablative hatch, and that had to be removed. I think it had to be removed from outside. I'm not sure. They they must have been able to remove it from the inside too. But um, anyway, that was the cause of the loss of life in the Apollo One when the pad fire happened and the overpressure happened. Uh, the, uh, actually the command module was already overpressurized. So it was around 16 PSI and uh, pure oxygen and uh, an instantaneous fatal fire killed, killed Gussum, Chaffee and White. And uh, that happened. I came in, in in June of '66, and that happened in January of '67. So it had been a really slow project up to then, because I was told that they'd finished the project and then the the uh, they were basically laying people off. We all knew where we were when that happened. Yep. So anyway, the result was to make what's like an airline hatch. This hatch hinges inward and then swings and goes through the opening to go outward. And uh, there's a, a gas bottle actuated uh, quick release on this thing. And uh, otherwise there's that mechanical linkage that you see there that, uh, that can be driven manually. 
anyway, next hatch, next next view. <laughs> yeah. Gary, tilt your camera a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. There you go. There we go. Yeah, I know. I keep doing that. Okay, here's the specification rock. Not really, uh, <laughs> but you can see that if that if a thirty inch rock were under the command module when it landed, it would it would, it would contact the the nozzle, or if the things if the feet sank into the to the soft surface of the moon, for instance, before we knew before we landed, we didn't know. And uh, anyway, that that bottom part of the of the nozzle, I think the bottom twelve inches or more, was uh, was a very thin columbium sheet, and it would crunkle and fail and buckle out of the way. And uh, so a Volkswagen you can't land on, but a a, a 30 inch rock uh, just is inconvenient. Next screen. That's it. No, there's two more. Oh, we don't need that. Next screen. This goes through my particular calendar, what, what I did on the spacecraft. On the, but uh, the manned missions are really, this is something we've been going through for the last year and a half now. Um, the first manned mission was uh, Apollo 7 uh, in September or October of 68. Uh, I'd left uh, Rockwell in, in July to go up to, to Lockheed, but anyway. Uh, so Apollo 7, we had a, a minor, oh, we, we, we had a, uh, a movie, actually. There was a, uh, I think there was an Apollo 7 movie about that time. Uh, Apollo, 9, Apollo 8, of course, was the first lunar mission, orbit and return. And uh, John's uh, lunar module was not yet uh, available. So it turns out that they used a, uh, a 30,000 pound simulator of, made of concrete blocks to simulate the, the natural frequency and mass of the, of the limb and uh, had to eject that. That, would, that made quite a splash, I guess, on the moon when they, I think they, they targeted that into it. Anyway, um, so of course they did orbit, and uh, and that was the most spectacular Earthrise picture that uh, basically changed our interpretation of where we are in the universe. In uh, March of '69, Apollo 9 had a lunar module available, and it did basically a lunar mission in Earth orbit. A full 14 days, I think, and uh, and then in in May of '69, Apollo 10 did a, a complete orbital mission, a complete lunar mission, uh, descending to 10 miles above the surface and uh, staying away from the command module for some some time, and then returning to the Earth. Uh, of course, July 20th, 69, the first man on the moon. And then in uh, October of 69, November of 69, November 12th, I believe, we had a, uh, an event where we rededicated uh, uh, Pete Conrad's Apollo, uh, Gemini 12 at the uh, at the uh, California Science Center, uh, and uh, Nancy Conrad, his his widow, came out and was uh, 
uh, was present for the for that ceremony and so it was a fairly quiet affair they they had a, a limited amount of press coverage but not much but not much um, and then of course this one Apollo 13 the successful failure <laughs> final mission was Apollo 16 uh, first scientist on the moon I think it should be 17 actually 17, right. yeah anyway um, Yeah, it's been quite a year and a half of uh, recollection. Gary, you open for questions? I am. We are. Anybody have questions? Hello? Yeah. Hi, I'm Leanne Brown. I just, I have a question. In Apollo 13, it was, um, they made uh, something that made oxygen that helped for the astronauts to get whipped around the moon and still have oxygen. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I'm not sure what you're talking about. If anybody else knows, welcome. I think you might be talking about the carbon dioxide uh, container, though. Yeah, I think there was enough oxygen, but like you said, <laughs> um, the carbon dioxide had to be absorbed, and the, there were not enough canisters um, in... Um, in the command modules, and so they had to take some of the the uh, uh, canisters out of the uh, lunar module and stick them inside a spacesuit and uh, tape the tape the arms into the feed system of the uh, lunar of the uh, of the of the other module. It was a uh, his pictures. Fred Hayes had a picture on his wall of this inflated astronaut suit floating behind him uh, during the mission. <laughs> I had just read an article um, that says Earth Angels, more than 25 years ago, South Bay scientists and engineers made a rescue of troubled Apollo 13 flight a mission possible. So I sent it to Gary on the email address if he wants to look at it. Oh, okay. There's not much I can do with with showing it to anybody else. I'm, I'm oh, I know. I just figured uh, you had mentioned that you, one of your only uh, ways of knowing about the situation was uh, the Apollo 13 movie. So I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me send him an article. <laughs> I, I've gathered a lot of stuff in, in yeah. the course of this year and a half. But you know, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> anybody else? Oh, I think we've done it. <laughs> Does Ken show anybody else? Uh, no, I don't see see anyone else uh, raising hand. Yes, if anybody has question, you need to uh, press the raise hand button on your Zoom app. Yeah, tell them where that is. As, uh, if you Zoom app is. Uh, uh, at the bottom, you do app, and there's a more button, and you press more button. It should have a clapping hand, and the you know, this, you know, and you can see the raise hand option there. Oh, actually, I might have to push view view options at the very top first. Yeah, for well, Gary, if you see the participant, uh, if anybody raised hand, you should see a hands over there, a hand over there, on the list. Okay. But for the attendees, uh, they need uh, they can only uh, do cool. you know press the. the yeah, here we are. We've also got the thing down there that's called reactions. Yeah, reactions. Right. But yeah, that's reaction not raising is, a hand. Yeah. So Gary, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is being recorded uh, by the AIAA, or um, was this one? It one? says so over on the left side. That's, yeah, that's it's being recorded. But of course, Gary, uh, uh, we need to have the permission, you know, uh, to upload, you know, online, you know, on YouTube, website, social media. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, that would be in, on the part of any speaker, I presume. 
That's right. Yeah. If we can cut off any speaker if we want. You know, we can trim the video if we want. Okay. Well, let's let's go around this the horn of those who talked. Okay. So I'm I'm good with that. Okay. Yeah. I'm good, I'm good with that, John. Okay. Is uh, Don still uh, available? Don, Don offline. He he went uh, okay. knock off, and Jerry also knock off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's Ken. Oh, Ken who? Oh, the speaker. The, the... Okay. Ken, Ken Lui? Yeah, the home Ken there is one of the people that's uh, uh, that's that's on my image, and and I think we talked oh, okay. a little okay. bit just coordinating the the setup. Okay. Um, well, I have. Uh, Gary, I think this was great. I really appreciate it. And I think the hearing from you and Jerry and, and Don and everybody um, was just really uh, brought back a lot of memories. And uh, uh, thank you for pulling it off. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Definitely my pleasure. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, there's quite a few people still on here. Oh, somebody raised hand. Gus, Gus. Okay, let me. Uh... One second. Okay. Okay. Gus, go ahead. Gary and, and team, but this is a great presentation. I actually did not know the root cause uh, analysis uh, of uh, where, why the explosion exactly occurred uh, and uh, so this actually brings uh, a little bit, little bit of, um, of uh, technical uh, background into into the mission it wasn't just a random explosion as uh, you know some of the uh, some folks uh, seem to believe I'm wondering if uh, when you do a um, you uh, offer the, the, the recording of the of this program, if you can actually put some of the references where some of the technical analysis or AI development papers or whatever presentations have been made, if somebody wants to dig deeper into it. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to be able to put the references on board, but I think that would be a little awkward. Um, so, um, I, I think we're not going to do that, but I, we can see. But thanks for the thanks for the suggestion. Okay. Okay, Gil, there's another. Uh, Gil, Gil has a question. Okay. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Gary, thanks for sharing uh, the story because my dad worked with you at North American Aviation. Um, uh, boy, right. You, What's up? Is that Bob Gilroy? No, no it was uh, Gil Flores. Oh, Gil Flores. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. just need so, Gil, uh, Gil, Gil, but okay. Yeah, so um, what's crazy is um, I found his award, which contained a piece of the Apollo 13. Really? And I was just curious, was this common practice by at North American? Uh, to just give employees pieces of the... Uh, <laughs> of the craft no no it was not common that's an extraordinary recognition wow okay thanks for letting me know that i was just kind of a shocker when i saw it i'm like it says certificate of authenticity and presented to gil flores blah 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 and i was just like wow okay so i'm definitely going to take care of that <laughs> that's one of those memorabilia you might even be able to take to antiques road show someday oh no never never <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, actually, there are a number of people who who received uh, silver uh, Snoopy awards from this event. Uh, uh, Gary, Bob, Bob, gentlemen, Bob has a question. Okay. Bob, go ahead. Oh, this Bob Schaefer. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, do you also have the video uh, turned off on me? You, 
and for yeah. most of the participants. <clears throat> yes. Uh, you know, you missed an opportunity. You had Tom Barrera on there, who was a North American engineer who was in charge, responsible for the cryogenic tanks that each aircraft built. Oh, really? Uh, unfortunately. Which, which uh, Tom was that? What's his name? Tom Barrera. He was there. Oh, yeah. No longer. I don't see him signed in. I think it's because every. Uh, Buddy was uh, the videos for everyone was turned off. Uh, I was uh, with North American Aviation from 1962 to 92, spending my career on the Apollo and the uh, space hey, shuttle, but on the Apollo. Hey, Ken, program, can, Ken can you spotlight the uh, the speaker? Yes, uh, I asked him to start on. the video. Uh, the video. Bob, can you turn on the video? There's a button on the lower left that says. I'll try to turn it. It says it's, it was uh, turned off by by the host. No, the, we already enabled it. You should be able to turn on. Do it again. Yes. Start my video. Okay. okay. Now, that applies to everybody, I think. Uh, all those people who uh, I, don't I see was images. I about 1962 to 92 and spent uh, the ten, or 12 years with on the Apollo program, and. Uh, I was in the, when Paul 13 was along, I was in the mission design group uh, for North America, which, uh, uh, and my area of responsibility was electrical power and consumable, so I was involved in the yeah. power analysis and the cryogenics, and, and on the Apollo 13 mission, the, the, our primary duties after the explosion were uh, I mean, we weren't trying to investigate the, the reason for the explosion. We were trying to get them back. So uh, it was, uh, as it's been pointed out, that uh, you know we had we had a very limited uh, entry battery energy left because it had, it had been put online uh, uh, while the fuel cells were fail, failing. The normal procedure was to bring the batteries online to supply power, and, and then we had to get them off. And get that command module powered down uh, before uh, uh, we drained the batteries completely. We knew we had to have reserve enough energy for, for entry if there was going to be an entry. <clears throat> and then we, of course, uh, during the uh, lifeboat operations, we were spending our time uh, first determining how much energy we did have remaining in the battery based on the telemetry data we had and an analysis to fill in the blank spots. Uh, and then coming up with a, uh, a power up procedure and a, and a power down type of entry, which could be supported by the amount of energy we still had in the band. And uh, so those, that was a, those were the procedures then that Ken Maddenly down in Houston was was trying to verify through the uh, in a simulator down there that that uh, that they could in fact fly that that uh, entry uh, <clears throat> and and get down uh, to the water. We, of course, uh, normally we, the requirements were that we have a, a, a significant uh, amount of time on the water waiting for rescue, although. For Apollo 13, we obviously didn't uh, allocate much energy for we, that we we had to assume that the, the recovery crew would be there uh, it, it quickly, and which they were, and which they were for all of the entries. But uh, you know, one of the things you point out about the uh, when they made the uh, after getting back on a, the uh, uh, Free return path, and then then we had to make a decision on the, uh, on the accelerating the return. But there were three options, and we actually took the middle option. It was not the shortest return. The shortest return would have been we would have ended up splashing down in the Atlantic, and of course all of our recovery crews and ships were normally in the Pacific uh, for 
<coughs> for entry, and so we chose that that path, the fastest one that would get us back to the Pacific uh, entry point, which which was about ten. We had to fly it about ten ten hours longer than than it, it was possible if we had uh, uh, gone to the to the Atlantic. Someone you mentioned about the water not being critical on the, uh, because this was on the lunar module, and I, I I was responsible for the cryogenics and the water and the rest of the were on the CSM, but but water was critical on the lunar module because it was also used for cooling. Uh, all of the LEM electronics were cooled by an evaporation system, and uh, right. that was a driver on, on how much power they could could have uh, in the lunar module. Uh, it was not so much limited by, by battery energy as it was by the amount of uh, water they had available to reject heat. Um, and so water was a critical thing. And of course, you pointed out about the lithium hydroxide was, was really a, a driver there and not so much that we there was plenty of it but unfortunately most of that lithium was in the <laughs> command module canisters which were the rectangular ones and uh, versus the lunar module uh, certain round canisters which i always considered was kind of a systems engineering screw up that uh, that we didn't have them both the, the same, but I think that was a result, you know, of, of um, we were well into the program before. I mean, as you pointed out, before we even chose the uh, lunar orbit rendezvous mode for for landing, and uh, then uh, initially, of course, the North American wanted we wanted to. Uh, we thought we should build the, the lunar module, uh, lunar excursion module, but uh, uh, there was, you know, some concerns about having all of their eggs in one basket, and uh, they were uh, uh, Grumman uh, to build that the, the lunar module, and of course, and that was under a separate contract. It was not. Uh, most of the contractors on the, on the program were, were uh, we were the contractor, we were the primary contractor, and we had some uh, control over that. Uh, the government contractors directly with NASA and uh, North America was not involved in that. To kind of smooth up and eliminate some of those kind of problems. Uh, of round versus rectangular. Uh, the uh, appreciate you guys going through all the things that I mean the uh, lunar model surely did its its, its job as a landfill. I don't know whether many of you if if you were involved with the you know, mission uh, control, I was generally uh, we had people both down in Houston in '45, and then we had a mission support group in New Delhi, which was ran uh, 24 hours a day, and uh, we would get the data in there and, and consult with the, with the folks in Houston. But prior to missions, uh, we uh, we went through exercises we called what ifs. What ifs, and, and they involved the crews in the, in the, in the simulator, and uh, they would be flying a mission, and the, 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 the simulator supervisor down there in Houston would, would throw failures at us, uh, whether it be a fuel cell failure or, or <coughs> uh, what, what have you. Uh, we actually, in, in, in work up to, uh, to uh, 
one of the missions, and I don't know that it was all 13 or not, but in one of the missions, we had the simulator supervisor through in a failure where we did have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. And so during this simulation, we actually, uh, you know, had to go through and, and uh, de de we used that determine, you know, how we were going to do this and what we had to do. And so in a way, we had already experienced some of the things and we, we knew some, some peculiarities or like, uh, you know, it was very easy for us to transfer power to the lunar module. That was uh, from the command module to the lunar module. That was normally a normal procedure because the lunar module was powered up on using command module or command service module power. Um, uh, however, the reverse was not true. They, we couldn't bring power back to, to, uh, through the wiring uh, back through the tunnel into the command module from the lunar module. Which, yeah, Gary, do you have some more so questions we, coming? Anyway, we, so we had some experience uh, uh, using uh, a simulator experience in our training for the missions using the, the uh, LEM as a, as a life goal. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. so, so some at the bottom of the screen has been waving. Um, but, um, um, Tom was very, Tom Barrera was very involved in the uh, court right investigation which was the which was the post flight investigation to determine you know what happened why the tank blew up and he's a very he's an expert in that and wrote much of the report for uh, uh, on the failure analysis uh, going all the way from what you pointed to the, the fact that the tank was dropped a couple of inches that tank was uh, originally scheduled to be on the, uh, I believe, on Apollo 8. And uh, and that was in that service module, and they were removing the cryo uh, uh, shelf with the tanks on it to uh, to fix uh, those cryo tanks out of <clears throat> a little ion generator on the, on the uh, on them that would uh, help keep the uh, the uh, vacuum in the in the cryo tanks. Uh, as you know, but, uh, we those cryo tanks built at each. Uh, they said, that, you know, if you fill them with ice, it would take eight years for those tanks to for the ice to melt. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, vacuum that we had in there. Uh, but there was a the vacuum pumps were uh, causing an EMI problem, and, and so the the, they, the shelf was being removed to fix that EMI problem. And as somebody, I think uh, Gary pointed out, but the, there was one bolt left in on the on the shelf, and uh, when they were trying to lift it out of there, and what happened was that that bolt was stronger than the than the uh, lifting tool uh, for the shelf, and the, and the lifting tool broke, and the shelf dropped a couple of inches, and which caused uh, uh, the fill line tube to come loose from uh, the uh, from its uh, collar, which was up in the top, actually, in, uh, of the of the tank. Uh, we, when we did the the um, uh, the the lengthy time after the countdown demonstration test, where you talk about it taking us eight hours to detank uh, the, the thing, I mean, we had we determined during that our, our, our cryo people that <clears throat> that the um, fill line had had separated from its collar and so when you put 
hot air would normally de de tank and inject it hot oxygen or just warm oxygen into the into the tank. But the tank is not pressurized, so it's not super critical. <clears throat> and uh, there's a liquid level in there, and, and but that hot oxygen was intended to push the uh, liquid oxygen up through the fill line and out the tank and uh, wrap up through the vent line, excuse me, and, and, and uh, the fill and vent line and, and out of the tank. But there was the fact that it came loose, uh, the pressure was just, uh, it created in fact a, a pressure short. Uh, the pressure just fed back into the tank and, and instead of pushing the oxygen out, uh, the uh, that high voltage that you mentioned being put on the uh, heaters, uh, this was a uh, 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 CAPE uh, <clears throat> requirement or that they put in late in the program to, uh, to speed up the pressurization of the, of the tank. And that was to do it at uh, uh, putting 65 volts on the on the heater uh, element instead of the normal 48 volt spacecraft power. The, uh, <clears throat> there was a, uh, normally, I mean, and we had done that in numerous times in the, uh, in the uh, prior to Apollo 13, I mean, we had the, the previous manned missions as well as some unmanned missions that had fuel cells, so we had gone through detanking before. But uh, the, uh, as was mentioned, uh, since it was <clears throat> not super critical, they had uh, pressure. I mean, it was there was a liquid level, and so uh, as the tank, as the oxygen was slowly being driven out of the tank, it. Uh, it was exposing the, uh, the the heater, which would normally be submerged in minus 279 degree liquid oxygen. I mean, it was just in uh, gaseous oxygen, and the uh, the uh, <clears throat> thermal switch, which they all felt was uh, would protect you. That there was a thermal switch. It was at 120 degrees if it, the uh, if the uh, heater got over 120 degrees, it was the open, but it had not been qualified for the 65 volts. And it turned out that the heater switch, when the uh, cycle, first time it, it cycled, it, it welded itself closed. And so it was not there to protect the tank. And the, the temperature gauge in the tank again was. <clears throat> Was designed for for normal operation, so it was registered between minus 300 degrees and plus 80 degrees. So at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the the temperature gauge in the in, uh, in the tank was pulled off scale high, and so you never knew that we were uh, getting those temperatures, and they. <clears throat> The uh, the current to the uh, to the heater uh, was measured in the GSE, but not on the spacecraft. And, so, and it, it, uh, unfortunately, when you were doing cryogenic operations, loading or unloading uh, the tank was considered a dangerous procedure and a critical procedure. So the so no, now not uh, uh, monitor, be at the uh, uh, my screen there's uh, well maybe it oh I guess it's just fixed looks like it anyway the mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately the uh, the ground crew nobody was uh, could be around the GSE while they were doing the detanking and, and to monitor the, the current flow uh, 
to the heater and 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 verify that the uh, that the uh, heater possibly would have seen that the heater was not uh, cycling on and off and uh, uh, that you know, like you said, well, with those eight hours of, of applying the power to that heater and you know, double the voltage, uh, meaning four times the the energy uh, that heater was putting out. Uh, I mean, we the post light analysis of that might have gotten the heater may have reached 800 to 1,000 degrees temperature during that that operation. And I say it it. Uh, damaged all of the Teflon wiring and uh, uh, in there, and it was just a. I mean, it's amazing that there had been actually there had been two uh, fan cycles uh, in the mission prior to the one that, that caused the explosion, and uh, why uh, something happened, whether it was uh, one of the mid course corrections or or uh, some maneuver in the spacecraft uh, made the the wires must have changed the, the wires enough so that that when uh, at 54 hours they're into the mission, uh, Schweikert was was to stir up the tanks. Uh, uh, the, on that cycle, the the, the short occurred and uh, and ignited the uh, the uh, uh, te Teflon. What was left of the Teflon in the wiring, and, and which proceeded to go up into the dome, where there were there was uh, uh, aluminum parts. And uh, again, everybody knows uh, from the Apollo One fire, but you put oxygen. You got pure oxygen and and uh, and a fire that'll burn just about anything and uh so once it got into the the dome of the tank and, and where there was some aluminum, it really flashed off and and uh the oxygen was leaking into the bay four there where the tanks were and uh the uh, the actually the insulation that Kepler installation ignited, and that's what blew the panel off the uh, spacecraft uh, when when that happened. And uh, well, that's the that's the conclusion that the that the Courtright <coughs> committee uh, came to after they investigated the thing. And during the investigation, we did take another tank and and. Put it through the same process. Make the uh, the vent line <coughs> disconnect from the from the power and and put it through the the, the cycles that the, that we had at the Cape and and that's where we determined that that yeah just toasted all of the wiring in the tank and and of course the uh, the uh, the fans are, are AC powered, so 140 volt power uh, that we had. Uh, I think our AC was 24. Okay, I, I don't think, I guess Tom Barrera is, has left the, uh, the meeting. So uh, it's too bad because Tom is, a, you know, is a, an expert in this, uh, the area of the tank itself. So. But anyway, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to share a little bit about the experiment. <laughs> of course, the, uh, as, as mentioned, you know, it was maybe one of, probably turned out to be one of NASA's finest moments, uh, you, you know, uh, in getting the, uh, uh, I mean, the cooperation and the, and the <coughs> effort put in by, by not only NASA but all of the contractors and uh, you know pull this off was was simply amazing. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, thank you for for contributing. That uh, that's been twenty minutes of the of 
really delightful addition to the, to the story. Um, I just you know what is that you you mentioned you, a couple of times the Apollo one has been mentioned here. Uh, you know, uh, in 1963, in 1962, I think it was change one to our contract on the CSN was to go from the two. Because of the fire hazard of oxygen, uh, they uh, changed one was to change both the pure oxygen because that's what our experience is on, uh, on uh, you know, mercury and Gemini. And uh, of course, one thing uh, pure oxygen of five psi, which we are when we were in flight, versus that ground test for the uh, 16 PSI pure oxygen, which uh, make everything that uh, one. The other change too, ironically, and one that was uh, heralded by, also by Gus Grissom, was to, we had proposed a, 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 an outward opening patch and uh, also an explosive uh, hatch, an emergency explosion hatch. And <coughs> of course, that's what I'm saying, you know, he, he said on Mercury, his, his uh, hatch accident or, or inadvertently uh, somehow uh, ex exploded, which uh, we had said in our in their, uh, when they proposed, NASA proposed to change that, uh, we said, well, we had to go all the aircraft, we never had, we never, we never had a uh, canopy get blown up or, or in any of our experience. And uh, we, we knew of and put across these things, says, no, that's not right. I have a, a, Explosion to pick the catch off my my mercury capsule. So uh, that turned out to be change number two was uh, was uh, to go to the uh, inward opening uh, hatch. Uh, uh, the uh, NASA chief engineer Max Frechier was uh, he was an old uh, submariner, and uh, they always believed that you know, they wanted the pressure in their home and the, trying to seal the hatch, not trying to open it. And so uh, they, you uh, know, they wanted the uh, hatch, uh, they didn't want an, uh, an outward hatch. And uh, of course, that turned out those two items the fact that we uh, have pure oxygen and, and also the uh, that they, there was no way that their hatch could be uh, removed by, because of the overpressure. There was no way that, that uh, they could have gotten that hatch open. Plus, I mean, it took minutes for them to uh, to the open that, that envelope and hatch as opposed to just supposedly you know, like we had. Uh, we were so strong for that that our chief engineer, after we were changed to, which was to, to change the hatch, we kept the weight for the outward opening hatch on the books for another nine months before NASA ordered us to, to take it off the book that we were never going back to uh, to the explosive outward opening explosive hatch. Of course, we ultimately didn't do that after we followed the fire. It's, it's unfortunate that, the, you know, kind of the first two changes in the, in the major changes in the program, uh, contract changes, were, were directly, kind of directly associated with the, with the fire. Anyway, I thank you guys for, for all your sharing this morning. Yeah, I'm finished. I'm finished. <laughs>
thanks everybody for, for participating. And uh, I, I think this has been much, much greater than I thought. Bob, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't realize that uh, you had been involved in so much of the, uh, the power and, and also the uh, actual Apollo 13 event. Uh, I'm glad we, when they asked me if, if I recognized the name, I said yes. So. Uh, well, uh, to me, I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's when the movie, the Apollo 13 came out. I had retired, of course, to the Central Coast, but the local papers put out a, a headline that said, uh, Losos, I was living in Losos at the time. It's up near, in the Central Coast, near Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo. Uh, since Los Osos man did need to see Apollo 13, he lived it. So, and I think that uh, somebody was mentioning about, there's one of the award things from Apollo 13 with a, uh, a piece of fabric from the uh, seat, uh, hmm. from the couch of uh, Apollo 13. And uh, yeah, those are treasured, treasured memories and treasured, uh, memorabilia that I have. Okay. So thanks again, Gary. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, I'm going to wave at Jerry Lockenauer over here, who was previously the, uh, the, the, the person in charge of the Arrow Alumni Group that is the sponsoring source of this uh, this video. Um, anyway, he went back east and I uh, have been coordinating it since that point in time. But for everybody to know, uh, we meet every third th Wednesday of, the, of, the, of each month uh, at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. It's at the south side of the Torrance Airport. Uh, we typically meet at 11 o'clock as this one began. And uh, we typically regale ourselves with either career stories or uh, questions about black holes and similar kinds of technical and scientific issues. At the end of the hour or so of, uh, of, of the presentation or conversations, we move over to the uh, Olive Garden and uh, and stretch the stories further. So it typically ends up uh, somewhere between 1.30 and and uh, somewhere around 1.30 and that's the basis for this program. And uh, certainly anybody that's uh, has time available or welcome to come. It's it's called Aero Alumni, meaning that we're primarily retirees from the aerospace industry, but uh, there's uh, people drop in of all kinds of, of backgrounds and, and experiences. Uh, it's a fun group of people and uh, it's always got some lively conversations. So uh, indeed, the, you know, the Apollo 13 was a, was a spectacular spectacular failure that turned into a, a spectacular success. And, uh, One last I would like to uh, invite all of you when we, this uh, <clears throat> corona thing is opens up a little bit why uh, they're all welcome to come to the Palm Springs Air Museum where we have uh, we don't have any space stuff out there but we sure have a lot of airplanes that you'd be interested in. And uh, of course, there right. is uh, <clears throat> down at the San Diego Space and Air, Air and Space Museum, and uh, uh, there is uh, they do have an Apollo 9 capsule there. In fact, and they were having there was a, an Apollo 13 presentation and dinner scheduled April last Saturday, April 7th. <coughs> of course, that had to be canceled. And uh, so we 
weren't able to pull that off. But, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, but there has been a lot of stuff going on this, this year uh, uh, already because of the 50 year anniversary and uh, the first lunar landing in now Apollo 13. Yes, and up at the so anyway, California all, Science the museum. Up at the California Science Center, there is the uh, Apollo Soyuz command module, which is on display, and uh, along with it, the Gemini 12, which uh, was the one that Pete Conrad flew. Uh, Pete, of course, flew uh, Apollo 12, and. Uh, Brag that the all Navy crew landed better than the Air Force guys and the civvies. So, uh, anyway, thanks for everybody attending, and uh, I guess we can have a round robin of uh, comments if if you're up for that. But we'll we'll keep it brief. Come on in, Jerry. Yeah, Gary, uh, Jerry Lockenauer. I'm uh, in Pennsylvania now. I used to be a member of this group and att attended regularly, but it's nice to have this Zoom thing and to be able to attend from, from Pennsylvania. So thank you very much for that. Ah, okay. I thought you were- uh, Hi, Jerry. I you were out west there a time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anybody else? Well, maybe we want to sign off then. We're down to 15 participants, it looks like. Thanks very much. I hope we see this online to review. Don't know, that, that's a question to Ken. Oh yeah, yeah, it will be uploaded. Uh, I think it's, uh, we got uh, John, right? Gary, and uh, you're okay, so if Don, and Jerry is okay, we should be able to. If, if they don't, yeah, okay, we'll just post your part and the junk's part. That's no problem. I saw at one time up to 45, I think, participants in this meeting. So, yeah. 49. Pretty... I think the maximum as peak is 49. Okay. Hi, Bob. Hi. <laughs> I really like this uh, format. I'm up in Morro Bay. This is Rich Lehman and can't get down there, but. Uh, for major meetings, I'd encourage to repeat this even after we're through the crisis. Who's up in Morro Bay? Rich. Rich Lehman. Oh, okay, Rich. I used to, I, that's where I originally retired to, was Morro Bay in 1993. Mm -hmm. I see Bob Ackerman's in here too. He's. We worked together at PRW for some years. Uh, primarily, he was working uh, lasers, and I worked sometimes lasers and sometimes propulsion. So, all right. Yeah. I guess I'm. I guess I'm sort of hanging around. But uh, anybody wants to check out? There's a button on the lower right that says "Leave the meeting." Give yourself permission after the. The box shows up, and uh, and you're and you're on your way. Hey, bye, everybody. Yep. Okay. Goodbye. All right. What are we down to? Nine participants. Yeah, somebody might be just uh, leaving it on and then they went for lunch or something. Sure. Okay, well, I think, I think I'm going to go ahead and log off myself. Okay. Maybe the only way to coax other people to do so. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Thank you so much for helping with this, Ken. Oh, no problem. Anytime. You're this is very exciting. Yeah, no problem. You've, uh, you let everybody in as time came on, and when we had the one intruder, we got rid of yeah, him. Yeah, we removed right it right away. Yeah, yeah. And we uh, have the shield, you know, and the phaser, torpedo, photon torpedo. What's that? Star oh. Trek, the Star Trek to defend <laughs> from those intruders. <laughs> Great. So we, we, we say these are clean guns, you know. <laughs> good shot. <laughs> yeah, good shot, yes. <laughs> Okay. 
We're still at nine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming.